the steal by Iverson. Posting in. He won the game. He won the game. Be there to say absolutely no. Three from Scott. Yes! Do you love this game? It is the Sixers Talk podcast with you once again. We're brought to you by Wilmington University. Will you works. I'm excited. The juices are flowing. Kevin Rice. Uh, he is my co-host, of course, the Kevin Rice from Temple University. And Kevin, we got basketball tomorrow, real basketball and some great matchups with the Clippers and Lakers on a nightcap and the Warriors and Nets, Kevin Durant versus Steph Curry. Everybody's healthy except Clay Thompson. But yes. uh, are you as excited as me? We're almost there. It has not really hit me yet, to be honest. I okay. still I'm still kind of it'll hit me, I'm sure, today or tomorrow night, but I'm still kind of. So kind of easing my way into it, but at the point it does hit me, I'm probably going to be over the moon and just kind of realize that I'm going to watch real basketball again for the first time in like three months, which isn't that long, but <laughs> still seems Bro, like forever. I guess it's like two months, but I, I feel you. It, it feels so like you're pulled in so many different directions right now and basketball, which is, you know, at, near the top of the, the priority list, but it also is something that's like, a little surreal because of the way last season ended and here we are ramping up again and everything's been like in this pressure cooker as we Mm -hmm. get here to the opener for the Sixers on the 23rd but again the NBA opening up tomorrow on Tuesday um let's talk about before we get to the Sixers opener this last preseason game we didn't see Joel Embiid uh we saw Ben Simmons in a limited amount you know what my biggest takeaway was Kev hit me not seeing Joel gave me a lot more insight than I thought I would get because I saw Dwight Howard in a starting role and just the difference in the motor, Kevin, yeah. just, just, a t- just a different, I mean, the dude is 34 years old. Uh, he might be 35. I'm not sure, but um, he, I think he just had a birthday on, in December. So I think he's yeah. 35, but either way, just seeing the intensity and the motor that the, he has getting up and down the floor is completely different than mm-hmm. Joel. He is the best backup they have had uh, yeah. since Joel's been here and his tenure to seven seasons he's been here. But he gives them something different, Kevin. It is something different than what Joel has. And particularly, you don't have to run offense for him. He's getting alley-oops and mm-hmm. putbacks and offensive boards and such. Yeah, I, I think so- this, this is a real feather in their cap, man. It's so bittersweet because it's awesome that they finally have a backup now for Joel and someone who's not going to just hinder them on the offensive or defensive end like they have in the past. But if they just had a Dwight Howard in the Raptors season, ah, oh, yes, it just that I don't know why that's always just going to link in my mind where it's oh, we back up because you, you have PTSD from Greg Monroe. Greg Monroe yes. has given you PTSD. That's yes. fine. It was so such shame. Like, and there were viable options out there for center. Dwayne Dedman was available. There were guys they could have gotten that would have put them over the hump, I think. But we're that's the past. Now we're in the future with or the present, I guess, with Dwight Howard. And I agree, it was really hopeful, almost inspiring to see the Sixers operate without Joel and operate well with or like well without Joel. I think there were some very good grave concerns. But um, yeah, the Dwight stuff he was awesome on offense. He, I think, shot perfect from the field in the Pacers game. I don't think he yeah. missed. But the def- defensive end, he was a little, uh, eh. He had some trouble with Sabonis and the pick and roll coverage and everything. But he's older. He knows what to do. He just, I don't know if he has the burst or ability to do it anymore, which is okay. That's fine. Like, I'll take it. The best backup center. We he have. is a backup. Right, yeah. He's a backup. But, yeah, like, the, the games Joel doesn't play anymore, I have a little more hope, which is good. Yeah. And I think I I think the other the flip side of that is that I'm also hoping and and praying that this type of veteran who can go out and demonstrate and show the things that maybe Joel is lacking. And by that, I mean, like super strong pick and roll and in that aspect, Um, just just one game. Joel's screens did look stronger than last year. Yeah. From yeah, one sample game, but yeah, and just whatever he's gleaning from him in practice when it comes to those little nuanced things, when it comes to getting up and down the floor. How about Kevin? The, his physical just appearance like this dude is in shape, yeah, like ripped. And like when he had like his kind of rebirth on the Wizards, was it or the Rockets? He didn't look good, and then on the Lakers, he's like a totally new human. 
which is awesome. <laughs> yeah, man. And I, I've said it before on the Sixers broadcast. I, I don't know if they win the championship without what Dwight Howard was giving them off the bench, mm -hmm. uh, particularly as far as burst and being interchangeable. And, you know, obviously, if you watched, you know that they started him, you know, late in the playoffs because of the impact that he was making it. Yeah. And it, it didn't it paid dividends for them. So I, it's just that I'm, I'm looking at what he brings off the bench for this team in those games where Joel will be low managed. Mm -hmm. In those games where Joel maybe is nicked up or has the bubble guts again or whatever, you know, you want to you want to look at. But it's just a tremendous upgrade there. And I'm hoping that this is three time defensive player of the year. You know, he's super strong with the screen setting and the rolling. I'm hoping that's something Joel can mm -hmm. pick up from him as well. Yeah, there's a lot that he can just teach Joel, even if he can't yes. do it as well as he could in the prime of his career. But there's so many things he can just Joel can learn from him just from watching and listening. And, and I think it also will, you know, play into Dwight's hands as well because keep him around, man. This is a one-year yeah. deal. You could keep him around probably and, and get a, a team-friendly deal depending on how the season goes or his, mm -hmm. you know, draw outside of Philly. But keep him around, man. This could be the the person who Joel is able to kind of mold some of his game after with those defensive, mm -hmm. you know, strong suits that Howard yeah. possesses. I talked a while or a couple pods ago about retooling versus rebuilding with the Sixers and how they kind of handcuff themselves into not being able to do either. Uh, Dwight Howard's the perfect kind of retooling player of he's not going to cripple you financially. He's not going to be like a superstar who needs the ball all the time. Like he's in the twilight of his career. So that's a perfect retooling guy to have of just flexible contract. Awesome dude around the locker room. Awesome dude to teach the younger players. So um, that was a great signing and he's not Al Horford. <laughs> And he's not Al Horford. He gives them what they need without all those things you mentioned. Yeah. And I think the other thing that jumped out to me from this preseason game, and it, it wasn't even a big deal. We, we talked about it so much, but Ben shooting that three-pointer, um, I guess it was a two-for-one. Mm -hmm. You know, it was late in the quarter, um, and he was trying to get a shot up in order – you know, it ended up being a three pointer, but for the Sixers to get a two for one opportunity, and I had no problem with it. It looked fine. It mm -hmm. was a deep three. It, was, it hit yeah. front rim. But why he doesn't shoot them more will always be the question. But listen, man, that that that's the bit. I mean, I, I need to see more of it. But it, it, I think it's just becoming more and more just you know one of those things where Sixers fans are just like, all right, well, he shoots and he does it. He, he shoots and he does or he doesn't. It it doesn't matter. It's just more or less the fact that. He's going to attempt it. Um, mm -hmm. wh where were you on that? What, what did you feel about that when you saw it? What was your reaction? Yeah, I had a pretty – he was pretty uninspiring in the first half of the game, I thought. The th he had an open three earlier and pump faked it, and it actually kind of worked. He got downhill because the defender bit on the pump fake for some reason. But, <laughs> like, I'm like I'm fine with him shooting it. I obviously want him to shoot more. But he – one preseason attempt – isn't gonna sway me to being like all right here we go like he's shooting threes now right. like i the preseason would have been the perfect time for him to fire like four a game because no one's gonna care like the national spotlight's not on you if you make one great if you miss all four oh well you go from there but one attempt in two games is not fulfilling for me at all i haven't seen much growth offensively from him in those two preseason games from last year the season before so i am a little not I'm it's kind of sound like I'm hating on Ben again which I kind of am I guess but <laughs> it's it's uninspiring to me and I am not gonna hold out for any new changes for him offensively yet and, and Doc is kind of letting him off the hook um continuing to say things like oh I didn't know what really mattered where all the scoring comes from I just the mm -hmm. fact that we score and you know he he's not putting any pressure on Ben in that regard he's just trying to, you know, elevate the team overall. But I, I think, you know, when I saw it, it didn't catch me off guard. I think it was more or less like, oh, was that Ben? Yeah. And, and then it was more or less like, oh, what's going to happen to the shot? And then it hit front rim and then it, it missed. And there was it, it, it's no fanfare. I, yeah. I, I think hopefully, you know, he, he responds to that. That's but, another thing. There's no fans there to like boo him or like get on him for missing. Like, it's all just going to be on social media now. So, like, if you can avoid that part of it. So, this is the season, then. This is when he should start chucking them up, right? It should be. <laughs> but I don't know if he's going to. 
So the preseason game number two, I mean, you know, it's, it's such a short preseason. You wish you got more, particularly with this, you know, new lineup. And I think, you know, if I can be honest, Kev, which I'm going to be anyway, but it's just one of those, you know, things you say to transition between one topic to another. But it's just that I look at this opener and I see the Sixers at a disadvantage. Mm. They don't have the camaraderie or connection that some of these other teams have. I'm not saying they don't have a camaraderie or connection, but they don't have it to the same level as the teams that they're chasing. So you have a team like Milwaukee who has played together. They mm. add Drew Holiday to a mix that was already the best team in the regular season. And Drew Holiday is in no way, shape or form the type of player that will upset the apple cart. And since I mentioned his name, just a quick, you know, a tangent at, you're shaking your head. Did yeah. you want to say it, Kev? Because, no, you, you got it. You got it. I man, this dude is dedicating his entire salary from the NBA season. He make a pretty penny, I might add. But he's dedicating his entire salary from this NBA season to uh, small business owners, or is it a small black small, business owners? or Black-owned businesses. Black-owned businesses. There you go. Um, so I guess small or large, but Drew Holiday is dedicating his whole $25 million-plus salary yeah. to black owned businesses, man. Like, awesome. whoa, like we, we did come across something like this with Chris Long a few years ago with the Philadelphia Eagles who did it. But, but Kevin drew holiday, make a lot more than Chris Long, man. Yeah. He, I remember when drew was on the Sixers and like living, I'm pretty sure he lived with his grandma when he was playing here. And he was like, I was like, Oh, that's a cool guy. And then <laughs> he just kind of kept prospering. And I was like, heck yeah, drew, like keep doing it. And yeah. now, him and his wife Lauren Holiday, who's a U.S. national soccer team player. Yes, yes. Yeah, I don't know if she's still with them. I think she has hung up her cleats, but, yes, but she, she was a top tier athlete for sure. Yes. So they're just doing phenomenal work. We talk about a lot and just social issues of what can athletes use their platform for? Like, is kneeling during the anthem good, like bad for publicity? Like, does that actually do anything? But then Drew Holiday is doing an actual, like, tangible making a difference so i'm extremely inspired and proud of him not that he needs to be needs me to be proud of him but right uh, i feel you i mean but how can you not be impressed right like yeah. my gosh like yeah. what a pledge and what a outpouring of love from him and his family so um props to him from the sixers talk podcast and <laughs> he doesn't need it from us but uh we're extending our um co extreme congratulations for that type of decision so mm -hmm. that all really cool but getting back to basketball they bring Drew Holly and Milwaukee Bucks. He's not going to upset the apple cart. He's going to compliment what they already have there. You got teams like the Miami Heat who, you know, have all of their good chemistry and mm -hmm. energy coming off of an incredible finals appearance. Because of uh, Boston Celtics. But you, you feel me, though? Like, the Sixers yeah. aren't quite those teams. So this front beginning of the season, hopefully they can catch lightning in a bottle and be hot those first five games. Uh, out of the shoot are definitely winnable games for them. The Raptors being probably the biggest, maybe the Wizards and Raptors the, being the two biggest challenges they have there. But uh, you, you agree with me, right, Kev? Like the, yeah. the, mm -hmm. they're a little bit of a disadvantage. They haven't had that camaraderie since the 17-18 season, I think, when Covington, Sarge, McConnell, and all of them were still here, when it was very obvious that the team liked each other. <laughs> but um, even just the opener, you want to talk about like a culture shift. The Wizards bringing in Russell Westbrook, They've been posting like the Wizards social and everything. They've been posting a lot, and they look like extremely happy together. Right, it's like you buy in. You're buying into yeah. that, right? It's like Westbrook and Beal love each other, obviously, and Westbrook's hyping up every single player on the Wizards. Like, there's just that kind of character shift that the Sixers don't have. And I would have thought Joel would be that guy to do that, but he's mellowed out the last few years. He's a father now. He's talked about how that's made him more responsible. Ben has never been that kind of guy. Dwight Howard is. He's the guy who will hype you up. Justin Anderson was, but Sixers waved him, which I'm meh on. Uh, <laughs> but not Russell Westbrook level. I mean, no, this dude has it's, injected some energy, man. It's the difference being like, between Justin Anderson, like hyping you up on the bench, being that guy who runs off the bench when you score, and Russell Westbrook, who's doing that and also putting up like triple double, triple double numbers. So that's a point of not a point of emphasis but a point of question for the Sixers this season like who's going to be that spark like who's going to be that guy who like it was Josh Richardson last year and he's gone now which good for him but like there's no guy I'm confident in that's going to give them that punch or that spark just in the enjoyment of basketball way 
Right. And your point, not only is he doing it with his play, but he, he vocally, like he's covering all the bases. He's encouraging you and leading by example. Like what, what else can you ask for? So with that said, I think you'll agree a tough opener for the 76ers because we know Bradley Beal is going to be playing out of his mind. And then <laughs> Russell Westbrook with this new, you know, influx of energy and competitiveness and intensity. Um, the Brody and Brad show will, will be a tough task for the 76ers. And I don't know. I mean, you, you look at what the Sixers have and doc has talked about the fact that the defense is ahead of the offense um, which is good mm -hmm. uh, for the Sixers, particularly because they're they are, do have a bigger team, um, you know, w without Seth Curry in that mix. But um, I, so I, I'm encouraged that they're better than the Wizards overall. But that doesn't necessarily equate to an opening night win in any way, shape or form. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Their defenses look solid. Dan Burke, their new like defensive coordinator. Uh, mm -hmm. They look and they looked like they knew where they were going on recoveries in the second preseason game. Like just when they switched oh, as far as like the help defense and stuff like that, they would double, which I hadn't really seen last year. They doubled a lot more in that game. And then they knew where their recoveries were like shake. I'm pretty sure doubled off the ball. And then the Pacers ended up swinging it. Shake didn't go to the first guy. He just ran right to the uh, weak side corner because he mm -hmm. knew like, it was just a good sign of things to come if they knew where they were supposed to go defensively immediately. Um, and defense is one thing that I think, requires like less camaraderie or less chemistry whereas offense obviously requires a lot more of that knowing where you're gonna where your players are gonna be where they want to be and all that jazz so the defense is hopeful and that's something that can travel too like it's a good sign that the defense is is cooking so far but like they don't i i'm not gonna be surprised if they lose to the wizards and that was something i don't didn't picture myself saying like a month ago i was like all right. in and now right I, I great point back, like the Wizards are kind of revamped. They have it's like their, hard not to ignore it. It's yeah. hard not to ignore it. They have their lead guard, Ish Smith. <laughs> oh, I need an Ish Smith revenge game, Danny. <laughs> I can tell. Uh, you're champing at the bit for it. But uh, <laughs> I'm curious how, what you think about this, though, Kev, is that, you know, you look at the Sixers and the question was asked to Doc Rivers about where Matisse was playing um, and the fact that he's been at the back of the rotation. Mm -hmm. But Doc's reply was that, you know, don't read, you know, too much into the rotation. You know, Matisse is going to be playing a lot. Yeah. Do you believe him when he says that? Or because because based on what I saw, if Matisse was not one of the first three guys off the bench and those three were Shake Furkan and um, Dwight Howard. So if he's not one of those first three off the bench, that makes him guy nine or ten. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> I mean, yeah. It, it, you know, what he says and what he does could be two different things. And I, when I say that, I mean Doc Rivers, because what he says is that not to pay too, so much attention, but, even, you know, in two games, if Matisse is, you know, not one of the first three guys off the bench, he is in the back end of the rotation. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Can you, you, can you make some sense of that for me? Well, what's your opinion on that? I don't know if it's like a believe Doc or not believe Doc thing, but like even if he is going to be playing a lot and Doc is telling the truth, then it's a little bit of a weird decision because you want this new team to gel you want them to you want the experience start. right and matisse is a guy you matisse is definitely not a plug and play guy like he needs a lot of work on offense uh he's still fouling a lot i know you asked me a couple pods ago about does he need to control his fouling and i was like no he's fine uh but yeah, you I'm still like, see some of those tendencies right you might have been wrong on that one because he's that reaching in yeah so like i would be concerned that that's not the right move. If he's going to be playing a lot in the regular season, that why wouldn't he be playing in the preseason, learning to be around Danny Green, Seth Curry, all those different guys like Dwight Howard, even just, I would be fine. I guess I'd be fine if he doesn't play. Like I'd rather almost see shake for con Dwight and even Maxi over him at this point, but I will be monitoring that of course on opening night on Wednesday, but that's an interesting thing to look at for sure. And so let's just to draw that out a little bit more. So we got our five, which we know. First off the bench, Shake, Dwight Howard, Furcon. Mm -hmm. And then you have Matisse, Maxi, and Mike Scott, who have also gotten a lot of playing time. Doc has said it's going to be a 10-man rotation. Um, and, you know, maybe Mike Scott is, is the guy 10 or 11, 
but Matisse isn't further up than nine or 10, you know what I'm yeah. saying? So it's, I, I, I don't know. I just, if, if there's going to be, which we have talked about in the podcast, uh, him, he's going to be a three and D guy. There's got to be some three with that D or he's mm-hmm. not going to be on the floor that much. Or maybe he wasn't playing because there's a trade looming. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Is that where we're going? So yeah. it, 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 would that be for James Harden? <laughs> yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Um, that's, that's a good point. I, I just feel like when I look at what the Sixers have and what they don't have, Matisse doesn't bring anything that they don't get anywhere else. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. And it's the, shooting-wise, he doesn't provide that, which – Every team can use shooting. Um, Creation wise, same thing. He like yeah. Max, he are, impressed me so much more than anything I saw from Matisse last year in terms of like going forward with this team. Shake and Maxi, like that Shake and Maxi tandem in the backcourt, that was really fun. And like that's something I would like to just see in the future. <laughs> and, and for some, I, I'm seeing chemistry with Mike Scott. I mean, I don't know what it is with Maxi and Mike Scott. You know, um, I don't know. Um, you know, we see we see Tyrese Maxi with the all the Popeye's chicken for the flight, you know, to Indiana, but I don't know who his, uh, his veteran is. And, yeah. <laughs> but, but um, maybe my, him and Mike Scott seem to have some chemistry on the court. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm hoping Danny green and Matisse can link up to get, so he can glean a little bit there, but uh, I'm a little worried about where he fits in the rotation and everybody else. I, I see like straight lines and uh, can understand it, but him, I just don't see, you know, I saw a meme, Kevin, <laughs> And particularly after this last Eagles game, it definitely has a little bit more validity. And it was like uh, Jalen Hurts. Oh, oh, it was from um, Sixers and Six podcast. There we go. There, that's Aaron exactly Cliff, who it was. Yeah. Sixers and Six had the meme exactly. <laughs> and shout out to those dudes. They always serious. <laughs> yeah, but it was it was Jalen Hurts surrounded by the Eagles players, and it had Tyrese Maxey on you know his name you know printed on the meme, and then it was. Uh, Carson Wentz walking away from the huddle all by himself and it had Matisse Thibault on there because like Max he's like the new shiny thing yeah it was like okay Sixers and Six said it okay right I was thinking it but they said it yeah right they do, they do a great job over there shout out to them all right let's take a look at the odds from our friends at points bet sports book and it's <laughs> listen man I, you know Vegas is Vegas there's nothing much you can say but Kevin with all that's happened with this team they are still one, two, three. The seventh best odds to win the title at plus 2,000. The yeah. Heat, Celtics, Nets, Clippers, Bucks, and Lakers are ahead of them. Is, is that realistic? Are they I, the seventh best team to win the championship? I put them around that, I think. I hope. Um, I mean, we I talk about them being. They like were a six seed last year. I don't know if they're yeah. the seventh best team in the NBA, but. Well, like if they're going to be a three seed, four seed, then you could make the argument they're around seven eight nine the western conference is loaded but only one team's going to make the conference finals so right. it's so so as far as odds go the odds the sixers have to get yeah. to the championship are a lot better and then i guess the chances of them winning it are, are yeah. better than others too um I, I got some goosebumps thinking about them winning a championship just now but um <laughs> so all right so boom their their seventh best chance to win a championship they're also seven and a half point favorites against the Washington Wizards. Do you think that's uh, something that you would throw some shekels on? That I don't know. Um, I might go the other way as an opener. I mean, they. I, I yeah. even think that they might have. Good. You know, you know what I'm saying. It's just one of those weird. You know, everyone's kind of feeling themselves out. I think it'll be a tighter game than that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they could blow them out. I don't think they will. But it, I feel like it's going to be a close game on Wednesday night. Um, it's something that, again, I would not be surprised if they lose the game. <laughs> it's one of those things. But, like, if they maintain a 5.5, 4.5-point lead most of the game, then the Wizards end up fouling. Uh, they get some late free throws. They go up 8. They get a late layup, go up 10. Like, that's a possibility. 8 points? That's a lot of points for me. I, yeah. I don't know. I can, I, and that's To like, me – in my head, if I think they'll win by by eight, then all I have to go to the next step and think they'll win by ten, and I yeah. definitely don't think that's exactly. going to happen. Yeah, uh, I don't. I might. I might bet the Wizards. Uh, I yeah, I don't love the spread for the Sixers, but the championship odds I like. I might take that. Well, curious. You know, you look at those other teams that are ahead of them. The only Eastern Conference teams are the ones that we continually talk about: the Bucks, Nets, Celtics, and Heat. 
Do you think they're better than those teams? I think they could jump the Celtics. I don't okay. didn't love their draft. Didn't love Kemba their definitely won't be starting the season. They'll Kemba be slow out of the gate, the prop, most likely. So I think head-to-head matchup-wise, the Sixers are better than the Celtics. Um, but season's not played one-on-one. The teams play well against different teams, worse against others. So I think they can jump the Celtics. The Bucks, I think, are still going to reign supreme in the East. They are very, very good. Heat, um, I don't know. I was lower on them last year, so it's hard for me to say of if they can repeat that. That might have been a flash in the pan. They could. The Sixers could jump the Heat. The Nets are going to be better than the Sixers. They're loaded, and that's going to be a team I – Really looking forward to watch with Kyrie and KD. That's an extremely fun team. Yeah. Um, so I think they could get to third best in the East. Well, I think the thing, when I look at these teams, Kevin, I see all six of those teams having a perimeter or wing player who can get their own shot in crunch time, go one-on-one, create, or play make for other people. Yep. The Sixers don't have that, and that continually is a sticking point in why – the James Harden deal seems so appealing is that it gives them something they don't have. And that is a bona fide bucket getter. That's right. Um, unless you want to throw shake into the fire and have him be that. That's asking a lot, man. <laughs> I know. Yeah. <laughs> Taking a Jamal Murray leap and just being the right, guy. Right. The playoffs. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's one thing I'm lower on of if the Sixers can kind of game break that and win with a new formula, that's tougher to prepare for of you don't have that, one guy you can just guard one on one or lock down. Like if they can kind of change the game almost and have a different approach that's harder to prepare for, harder to uh, capitalize against, that could be a, a good avenue. But I'd rather them go with the get the bona fide superstar scorer and just kind of ISO people and win. <laughs> right. Grind it. Hey, uh, hopefully the winning is contagious for this team, but be sure to check out the odds from our friends at Points Back Sportsbook. Hey, we're bearing down on this opener. Uh, we're excited. Kevin is getting excited. He's starting <laughs> to feel it. He's going to get there soon. I'm sure, but... we'll end recording and I'll just like run around screaming because I realize that's, that's okay. That's all right. I just want a video. Just send me the video of okay. you doing it, and I, I won't post it on social media that you follow me on. But um, <laughs> I think the thing I'm thinking about is that as we're approaching the season, here we are with this team and trying to gel, and obviously all this. Um, you know, them becoming unified and and becoming a more solidified unit and team is going to bleed into the regular season just because there's not a lot of time to make those things happen, which you would get in training camp and preseason and whatnot. I'm curious if you had a holiday wish, Kevin, if you had something that this team could could get or or realistically attain, what, what do you think that thing is for you that would just be like, uh, a, cri- a present under the tree. Uh, I think you'll agree with me on this too. I think if the Sixers can get Tobias Harris back to the Clippers form he was in, I think that would be monumental. I didn't. I haven't seen that in the preseason though. Have you me seen either. any of that? That's no. That's why it's a wish. <laughs> it, it's like Tobias has kind of faded into the background, and not like um, he's not on the floor. But I just haven't seen any like difference making opportunities or him. You know hitting a few shots in a row that make me take notice or He's any of those still dribbling a lot things. Too. He is. And, and Doc has mentioned that he, he did a lot of that last season and that's not his strong suit. And he wanted to get that out of, you know, his repertoire, but c- continue with your point. Cause I, I just, uh, Tobias, that point I think is, is something that, that may linger here for a while. Mm-hmm. If he can't just find his way. Yeah. It's this a couple of the first preseason games too. Like he was just dribbling a lot. He was trying to create and, I was getting angry when I think there was a lineup that had him, Joel, and then I think Shake Furcon. Like it had shooters around them. It was shooters and Joel. And Tobias took it to the post and just backed his guy down and then just missed the shot. And I was like, you have all these awesome players around you. Please don't dribble into a post up. Like I already saw enough of that last year. I can't do it anymore. But if they can get him back to just a catch and awesome catch and shoot guy, awesome at like getting him moving downhill before he catches the ball so he can get into that little mid-range game that he loves, but quickly. Uh, I think that would be super significant for the Sixers' success and just their their chemistry and their offensive motor almost going forward of just they're going to be a lot cleaner on offense if he can get back to his Doc Rivers Clippers days. 
I'm curious. I know you are a guy who likes to, you know, kind of analyze the film and be a little, uh, you know, detailed in that regard. I haven't seen the stuff that Doc has talked about. And Doc has talked about the fact that he's dribbled too much last. He felt like Harris was dribbling too much last year and that he needs to be going more downhill. Mm -hmm. And that would be like a pick and roll, like decision making opportunity for him. Like he he excels in in those decision making opportunities is, is what Doc is saying, where in the pick and roll is either like a pass or shoot or pick and pop or like like how how Tobias, you know, makes those decisions is, is one of his strong suits. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen a lot of pick and roll where he's had those chances, but and, yeah. and not. Not ma bad. not where he's the handler, but where he's the the screener. Because mm -hmm. you can you can pop with him too. Like if he screens, right. you can just pop right out for three, catch and shoot three. It's all you need him to do. <laughs> yeah. So I, I haven't seen those opportunities, and we'll look for some of that. But I, I think that's a great example. I think he has kind of faded to the back and in, in background in some instances where you don't know he's out on the floor, and he can't be. And I hate to go to the money, but he can't be making that much dough, dominating that much of the salary cap and not making an impact on the court that reflects somewhere close to what that might be. Mm -hmm. and so Clip, Clippers Tobias, man, is a great example. Mm -hmm. Danny, what's your holiday wish for the Sixers? Oh, my holiday wish. Um, and, and this is kind of, you know, every I think everybody wants this wish, but I need Joel Embiid to be – uh, you know, put it all together. So not not necessarily be, you know, this ferocious, you know, Shaquille O'Neal type of guy. And, you know, not necessarily to be the super stretch five. I just need the the balance of the two. Mm -hmm. And that Joel B to me is, is a higher basketball IQ, a passing out of double teams, of finding the open shooter, um, a higher basketball IQ, continuing to draw those fouls and get to the line, and the consistency that comes with that would be – he's the rudder, man, in my, in my eyes, because whenever he's out on the floor, everyone in some way defers to him because he often has advantages and mismatches and is the guy who – on both ends of the, like you want to reward the big man for great defensive play. And he's also establishing great position down low. Like he he's dominating without the ball in, in those aspects of creating position and space and things like that. And they, you know, bring in these shooters to, you know, stretch the floor so that Joel has more opportunity and space to work and things like that. So I, I just, I, I need him to come into his own to really accentuate all the moves they've made and he's the man bro he is the man and yeah ben has the ball in his hands but joel is the best player on this team he's the reason why people want you know to bring james harden in there so this duo can work together of joel and harden and i need joel to be as advertised so i don't even know if that's a holiday wish because it it, it can happen yeah. it's not even like it's a you know, your, your pie in the sky type of thing. Like, this is something that could really happen. Mm -hmm. um, Clippers Tobias, I'm not so sure <laughs> can happen. But I wish. It's not my, yeah. maybe not my, my top wish. I'd rather. Right. Uh, but but it's a great one. And I, <laughs> I would have probably taken that if you hadn't taken it. But but do, how, what what is your opinion on Joel and, and those putting it all together things? Like, this is year seven. This is it, right? Yeah. He has to put it all together if they're going to take that next step. Can they do it without him? I, uh, I don't think they can do it without him. He's the best player on this team. Um, it's He's better than Ben. <laughs> I'm going to say it right now. Joel Embiid's better than Ben Simmons. And not to interrupt you real quick, Kev, but did not even to say that he has to be like this transcendent MVP type player, but just to put all the ducks in a row yep. of accentuating his skills and not be exactly what he was last year. And I think uh, when we had Jason Dumas on, he said Joel was dogging it and he was still dogging it and putting up 20 and 10 numbers playing awesome defense. But like if he's more locked in this year, I think he can put it all together. We talked about Ben not shooting threes in the preseason. Joel was firing. Like, yeah, he 0 for 4 in the opener. <laughs> obviously, but that's fine. Like, I'll, yeah, no, nah, it's fine because it's keeping like, the defense honest and the threat is there. 
Yeah. And like, he's obviously trying to work on it and in a team with much better spacing, that can be a viable option for him to get out of the post, not have that wear and tear on his body. You talked about advantages that Joel creates being a top two center in the league. You're going to have an advantage every single time down the court, the best post up player in the league. You're going to have an advantage every time down the court. So if he can figure out that in and out game on offense of just knowing where to be, becoming a little bit of a better roller, which we saw in the preseason game he played, he was cutting more. He looked like he had a con- had more control over his body when he was going downhill without the ball, which is very promising. Cause if you get a seven to seven foot guy down till at Joel's size, like no one's getting in front of that. You, <laughs> you almost have a dunk or a layup every time if the pass is good and the cut is good. So I, think that Joel could put it all together this year or next year. Um, Even if he doesn't put it together, you still have an awesome player. Like we saw last year, he was an awesome, awesome center who was not having fun. So if he's having fun and playing well, that's a scary thought for the rest of the league and a very fun thought for us. You bring up a good point because I think there was a emphasis last year on just getting to the postseason. Like that was the thing. Like, man, we just got to get to the postseason and then we can, you know, figure it out or kind of like you really start this fire type of thing. And Mm -hmm. and as you can see from how last season went, it, it just there are so many things that you don't control. Who could have predicted that a pandemic would come in the middle of the year? or toward the end of the year and just shut everything down and create this bubble and the juxtaposition. Like who knew that that would happen? But I think it brings out a great point is that you, as not that Joel wasn't going out there trying to dominate and be his best self every single time, but you just have to take everything step by step. You know, they had this expression of football, you know, we're just trying to go one and oh this week. Like, because you just can control each week at a time, each game at a time, each possession at a time. So, whereas the Sixers have so much pressure and expectations and delivering in the postseason, it's such an important part of what this organization needs to do. But also, there is a day to day, step by step aspect to it of just going through, uh, and performing and being transcendent every time and every opportunity. So I think, you know, while the the team is focused on these lofty long-term goals, I think that that kind of, you know, kind of overwhelmed them a little bit when it came to delivering, because I don't think that they quite went through, you know, uh, injuries are a part of it and they had setbacks and things like that, but there's got to be like a day to day, like taking care of business type of mentality you know that businessman's approach mm-hmm. of that everyday stuff that i think will pay dividends late in the season yeah going one to know every day or every game and then also just learning if you don't or if you do and just learning right to- uh, not a loss a lesson great point yes perfect and like i was a big guy of like just get you out of the postseason healthy. Like, I don't care if he takes load management games. I still don't care if he takes load management games. I'd rather I think that's the PTSD. It's like we're all just like so like caught up in all this postseason and the Kawhi shot and somebody's yeah. like, ah, like we just want to get get yeah. back and get revenge and because mm-hmm. it was other like they, lost, they lost on an anomaly, like probably the greatest shot in the history of one of the greatest shots in the history of basketball. Or like most iconic shots of just how it went in. But no, you're you're right there. Yeah. Yeah. Um I don't think that like the Sixers can they can't just coast again to the playoffs like they did last year and they didn't really even coast they were a five seed so like that's not six six seed yeah so that's Mm -hmm. not that's not coasting the playoffs like you you were in easily but that's not really coasting and if Joel's taking games off for load management which he should because it's taxing um this team needs to figure out how to win without him which is something I was never besides the Ben's rookie year where they went up like 16 and 0 and that one stretched up. It's since then I have not been confident they can win without Joel in any game. So if they can't figure out the non Joel games, then I am very concerned because anything can happen at any time. And if Joel, for some terrible reason that I'm knocking on wood never happens, but if something happens where he's not in the playoffs, then I lose a lot of hope. So if they can have him, have Joel be that catalyst on both ends of the at both ends of the floor and learn to win without him and play without him. Then I think it's going to be a good season. <laughs> because they don't asking. they don't have guy like Tobias Harris. Mm-hmm. You would hope would be the guy they could lean on to, you know, pick up the slack and things like that. But he hasn't shown that he can do that. So I, I think Dwight Howard does give me hope. 
as far as if Joel misses time because he offers something that they have not have not had just being a capable backup, but also being someone with a motor uh, that can produce. But I, I, I think that as currently constructed, like a four seed, three seed might be where they are, but mm-hmm. they also don't have the benefit of, you know, that home court advantage like they had last season. Maybe, mm-hmm. maybe the road won't be as daunting as well, but one of their biggest feathers in their cap was that fact yeah. that they yeah. were so good at home and, and with no fans in the stands, you, you don't get that benefit. All right, Danny, I have, I have a thought for you. Say, say Joel takes a game off and like, mm-hmm. all right, the Sixers on Joel tonight. What if instead of falling back on Ben Simmons, Tobias Harris, you're falling back on James Harden? <laughs> Hell yeah, <laughs> pff, man, that, that's a whole different conversation. Yeah. And Hey, Ben Simmons as a small ball five. Are we there yet? Are, are, is that something we're entertaining? Like what is that the, even the defense, on, in your radar? No, the defense is not up to par. He's not, he's very strong, but he's not strong enough to kind of bang bodies with those centers down low. So bonus ate him alive. He's has some pretty eh, pick and roll coverage reads when he's the five, which like, it's not his natural position. It's not a right. slight to him, but he's not, he can guard one through four. He can guard one through five, but he can't be the five. He can right. switch onto a five and guard him for a possession or two, but having him in that is not going to, I think, maximize his defensive abilities where he's out on the perimeter. He's long. He can move with those guards. That's kind of a, a waste on his part to put him down on the block with centers who are going to out match him. Yeah. I, I feel you Kev. I know you want to trade for Harden and <laughs> um, I think the asking price is too steep, but I see your point that yeah. if you're resting Joel and B, but you're trotting out James Harden and Danny Green and Seth Curry and all of a sudden, like your scoring is not one of your biggest concerns is who's going to, you know, plug up the middle. And there's where, that's where Dwight Howard comes in. Um, Not to the Joel Embiid extent, like you mentioned, but Mm -hmm. he does, uh, it does fill the void as a capable backup, but those are our holiday wishes. Um, Which one do you think is more likely to happen? Joel, I think. <laughs> not to bias, right? You don't have any you don't no. have any confidence. It's a lot. Not not any, but you know what I'm trying to say. But um, hey, we here from the Sixers Talk Podcast want to wish all of you out there a happy holiday season, healthy holiday season. Um, we are uh, just elated with all the contributions you guys have made to make our holidays happy with the five star ratings coming in, as well as the comments and the thoughts and the, you know, people stopping me, asking me questions if, if they see me. Not so much now during the pandemic, but <laughs> that, that does happen you know, from time to time. But uh, and Kevin, I, I want to thank you for being my co-host because thank I, you I, I uh, you've lived up to all the expectations and I appreciate the energy that you bring. So thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. So uh, for Ben Barry, our uh, slash co-host producer for the Kevin Rice for Temple University. Thank you from the Sixers Talk podcast. I'm Danny Pommels. We appreciate you. We're brought to you by Wilmington University, of course. Wilm U Works. Mm-hmm.